always try to encourage leaders to ask the question, first of all, what is our strategy and what therefore are we trying to achieve? And do we have the culture we need to execute this strategy? So that intersection between culture and strategy is absolutely critical. And then further, are the behaviours that earn belonging the behaviours we need to see more of in order to successfully execute this strategy? Hello and welcome to the Manage Self Lead Others podcast for experienced and aspiring people managers. I'm your host, Nina Sunday. Listening to this show helps you explore ways to become the best version of yourself at work as a manager. Each episode, you hear from some of the brightest business minds on the planet, and they'll share your passion to elevate and transform team culture. They share insights in self-leadership and leading others. Together, we can make workplace culture better. Are you ready? Because it's time to manage self, lead others. Deanna Robertson is a culture, leadership and teamwork expert who holds an MBA from the London Business School. Former head of culture at one of Australia's big four banks, the National Australia Bank, Fiona authored Rules of Belonging, Change Your Organisational Culture, Delight Your People and Turbocharge Your Results. It is my honour to welcome Fiona to the Manage Self Lead Others podcast. Welcome Fiona Robertson. Thank you so much, Nina. It's such a pleasure to be here. And I just want to say, this is an important book. Uh, All accolades to you. I believe that every leader from CEO down to emerging leader needs to read this book because it's the best book I've come across. But you you give us step-by-step how to change culture. It's, it's like you've got worksheets and diagnostics and you even mentioned some of the tools and we won't go into all that detail in this session, but honestly, everybody listening, just get this book because it is a how to change culture and so few books, they tell you what the problem is without telling you how to fix it. <laughs> Well, I'm so glad that you found it useful and, um, and thank you. I'm, uh, my intention was uh, to try and explain what culture actually is because it's one of those words that we all use very liberally and you know, leaders are very quick to acknowledge that culture is important, but many of them, um, dare I say most, um, don't really know precisely what they mean when they use that word culture. And so in my experience, the, uh, the conversations that happen inside organizations or even inside teams about culture, often you know, two or three people will be having a conversation and they're all actually talking about something slightly different. And because they don't know that, um, some of those conversations end up being quite circular and kind of not getting to any kind of practical conclusion. So I tried to write a book that was Here's what it actually is and language that you can use to understand and, and you know, shared understanding, shared language. Um, so that's point one. So you can start to have a sensible, meaningful conversation about it. Um, but as you say, then, OK, so now we know what are we actually going to do about it and, um, and you know, some practical, some practical tools. So I'm so glad that you found that helpful. But here's the thing. It's all about pattern recognition. And culture is almost invisible one of the things i say when i'm presenting is culture hides in plain sight you have to actually have your eyes open to notice what are the assumptions here what do people assume is how things are done and is that the best way is that the only way is have we fallen into complacency are we continuously improving uh even to continuously improve some people don't even uh, acknowledge that that's something we should be doing. It's like you you fix the something and then it's done. It's like well, no. As you as you end the book, uh, culture is an is an ever ongoing marathon. <laughs> yeah, it's changing all the time, all the time, uh, and it's either happening by accident or it's happening deliberately. Obviously, I'm a fan of deliberate, but um, yeah, that's a you know culture hides in plain sight is such a lovely way of putting it. Another way I think of it is. Um, It's a bit like living in the matrix. If you don't know you're living in the matrix, then you don't see anything because you you don't know there is anything to see. 
But once you understand what culture actually is, then you can see it everywhere. Um, and as uh, the, the title of the book somewhat gives away, I believe that what culture actually is, is the rules of belonging in a group. So it's what earns, what behaviours earn belonging and what behaviours lose belonging in this group. And the reason it's really tricky to see is because we often try to look at behaviour itself as the determinant of what our culture is. But in my experience, it's actually the interpretation of behaviour is where culture lives. So to explain that a little bit more clearly, I think an example can be helpful. So I once worked in an organisation where it was very common for the most senior person in a meeting to leave the meeting before the end. Uh, in that particular culture, busy equaled important. You know, I was high status if I was running from meeting to meeting. So if the senior person didn't, leave, didn't stay till the end of the meeting, that was completely normal and accepted. And in fact, uh, once that person had left the room, everybody who was still there would sort of nod knowingly at one another and say, well, of course she had to leave early because she's got another meeting to go to. So that behavior, leaving the meeting early, um, increase that person's belonging or their status in the group. But I've worked in other organisations where that identical behaviour, senior person leaves meeting before the end, would have been considered the height of unprofessional, um, disrespectful to one's colleagues, clearly a person who didn't value accountability or making next steps clear or whatever it might be. And when that person left that room, everyone sitting there left behind would be going, oh dear, that's, you know, that was awkward. Um, and so you've got identical behaviour. Senior person leaves meeting before the end, but in one system, it increases belonging and status. And in the other system, it decreases it. That is where culture lives, in the interpretation of behaviour, in what earns status or belonging around here and what loses it. And that's what we need to pay attention to if we want to shift the culture. Um, we are evolutionarily, is that a word? Um, yep. We are biologically uh, programmed to belong to groups. Mm -hmm. And so we, are, we have these evolutionary superpowers that allow us to identify what is successful behaviour in a group what earns status or belonging, what earns safety, essentially. Um, and we will consciously or unconsciously begin to adopt those behaviours as our own. The journey in your book actually starts with you um, nailing Maslow's hierarchy of needs and saying there's a basic need even before uh, the, the, the bottom of the pyramid, food, water and shelter, and you say belonging is the underlying need and it, it actually cuts through. So tell us more about that, please, Fiona. Yeah, for sure. It's a really interesting one. Um, so essentially what uh, neuroscientists have now been able to establish is that the human brain cannot distinguish between social pain and physical pain, yeah. which is an extraordinary idea. Um, so, you know, all those times when we were the little kid who wasn't invited to the birthday party or picked last for the soccer team or whatever it might be, that pain that we were feeling was, you know, that was real pain. Candor is one of the 10 dimensions, which I mentioned earlier. Why does trying to increase candor scare people? Mm. So, um, so back to what I said before, the human brain cannot distinguish between social pain and physical pain, and it will do everything it can to avoid social pain. Candor requires us to be prepared to be vulnerable, to um, say things that we think are risky, so that might blow back on us in some way, and to hear things that may well be painful. So another piece of research that uh, says that if you say to somebody, I am about to give you some feedback, their brain responds in precisely the same way as if you said to them, I am going to stab you with this fork. Oh. Um, it can't tell the difference. And so candor is scary. We know this from our you know, personal lives. You know, that, that conversation you know you need to have with your spouse or your child or your parent or your whoever, um, is scary. You can't uh, because it's how it's going risky. to land. Right. And, and even if it's someone you trust, are they in a good mood today or a bad mood today? Yep. Yep. And the brain says this is dangerous. Mm. Your belonging will be at risk if 
this relationship is damaged. And, you know, when you're in your workplace and your livelihood depends on your boss being happy and, you know, your ability to execute your role depends on your colleagues being happy and your team being happy, then stepping into that risky space of saying what needs to be said is, it is just that, it is a risk. So it takes an enormous amount of courage. Uh, so yeah, that's why I think candor is such a difficult one, such a critical one too. Well, and if you don't, then you've got artificial harmony and you, uh, you, it might also lead to groupthink, which might make wrong decisions being made because if you see a pitfall or a danger in, in, or un, unintended consequences to a decision, if you don't speak up because you think, oh, I don't want them to look bad because, you know, they think it's, it's wonderful or, or you don't have enough confidence in your own opinion because the fast talkers are dominating the meeting, it can lead an organisation down the wrong path. What what can we do to use silos for good then? Because I that this was one of my um, uh, things that I thought you could fix if you focused on silo effect, you could fix it. But um, I think you give the example of maybe cross divisional teams could be yes. one way to reduce that impact of us and them. But um, can you talk to that, please? Absolutely. This is such a difficult one because we are so hardwired to belong to groups. In fact, there's a, there's a piece of research that shows that if you put a group of people in a room who have never met each other before, none of them have ever met before, you split them down the middle and you say, okay, you're the purple group and you're the orange group and give them a t-shirt to wear or something like that. It takes less than 10 minutes for them to like and trust members of their own tribe more and dislike and distrust members of the other tribe yeah see that's the thing it's not neutral is it it's 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 no. a plus and minus not and in, minus. Not in the middle yes, yes. Mm. and so you know inside an organization your division um is your tribe yeah and so um all of the us and them that we see that's inwardly focused is driven by that so you you can try to fight it, but you're trying to undo tens of thousands of years of human evolution and you'll probably fail. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen it really succeed. What I have seen succeed is to create tribes, other tribes for people to belong to. So um, a cross-divisional tribe that is might be, for example, um, uh, actually an example. Uh, one, I was doing some consulting work for IBM a million years ago when I was living in London. And um, Lou Gerstner, who was the CEO at the time, had created this kind of, I can't remember what it was called, it was like a CEO club, something like that. Um, and essentially what he had done is identified people from the whole organization, very large, as you can imagine, uh, different countries, different um, tenures, different levels of seniority, different types of roles. He had identified people who were exhibiting the kinds of behaviors that he wanted to encourage. And he created this club, essentially a tribe of those people. And very cleverly, they had a symbol as well. They had this little tiny manifesto uh, back in the days when we used to be physically in offices and carry physical bits of paper around with us. It was this little manifesto that had a purple cover. And so um, people who were in the club used to just, of course, just carry their little purple, you know, in amongst their other papers, not too ostentatiously, but, you know, we all knew who was, who was in it. Um, and so that gave them a tribe to belong to that sort of transcended their organisational uh, divisional tribe and was an opportunity for him to embed new ideas right across the organisation. So you can absolutely, if you understand what's going on underneath these things, you can work with them instead of trying to fight them. That's Use them right. to your advantage, for sure. Now, another of the 10 dimensions is collaboration. And this is almost the holy grail. How can a team leader increase collaboration on critical initiatives? Yeah, I think, you know, the second part of your question on critical initiatives is the, is the important part there. Um, there is this assumption that collaboration, you know, more is always better. 
Uh, I don't believe that to be true. I think that um, often in teams, first of all, uh, the, the roles that all report to one person, um, you know, that, that's called a team, even when sometimes the different roles don't really need to collaborate very much on anything. Um, so I think that the first thing to do is to really identify collaboration on what. So which initiatives require greater collaboration and which don't, which just need a person to go off and do the doing and come back and tell us what happened. Right. So um, once that's done, which is a very, very important first step, and actually it's, it's a never ending conversation, um, then I think uh, making sure that those people feel like they have a shared objective. Um, and, and that somebody within the group of them is leading the initiative. I think that's important. If you have a group who are trying to achieve something, but they don't know where their direction, in, where their direction is meant to be coming from, then, you know, everybody's hoping somebody else will do something and nothing happens. Um, so I think that's really important, but making sure they have a shared objective and they, and their conversations are around um, who needs help this week to get things done. So the, so the rule of belonging underneath that is we belong around here by helping our colleagues and by putting the outcome ahead of um, any of the sort of tribal differences we might have. And by framing it that way, asking the question, who needs help? People are more likely to own up and say, oh, I need help with this. I need help with that. Because often people hoard tasks or, 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 or keep it to themselves that they're having problems because they think they're letting everybody else down. But the opposite, you know, not asking for help is letting people down. Absolutely. And that, that, you know, that social pain that we're trying to pretend, protect ourselves from is something that we absolutely need to get to, you know, get underneath uh, for teams to work really well. And, you know, for the leader, um, if they want to encourage people to help each other, then yes, they can ask that question who needs help, but then they can also make sure that anyone who gives another person help is called out for that. So, so it is clear yeah. that you earn belonging around here by helping each other. Absolutely. So that people yeah. read that, whether they, you know, whether consciously or unconsciously, they recognize that that's what good looks like. That's what will keep me safe. That's what belonging, how I earn belonging in this group by helping my colleagues. Yes, because lack of commitment uh, to team results uh, kind of is indicated by people going, well, me helping you doesn't help me get my stuff done. So why should I help you? So right. now you're making helping other people achieve their results for the team goals uh, definitely something that you get you get rewarded for. Yeah. Yes. And it's social. It's a social reward. Yes. That's right. So Just make, have it, make to remember, you feel good you're acknowledged. Yeah. Right. We have to remember that social rewards, social, and, and it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, a big award ceremony and all of that, because there are some people who would rather oh. chew their arm off than get up in front of everybody else. Um, but it is about making it clear that this is what, this is how you belong in my team yeah. by doing these things. And if somebody does the opposite of something like that, you wouldn't want to call them out unless it's really stark. You wouldn't want to call them out in front of everybody, but you would want to take them aside afterwards and say, look, that thing you did, I, I'm trying, you know, I, what I'm looking for from my team is the opposite of that. And here's right. the reason. Mm. One of the trends I'm seeing coming through in leadership is peer to peer accountability. But one of the things you talk about in the book is people taking delight in, in finding mistakes that in others or criticizing uh, other people's work. So it's it there's a fine line, you know, receiving or giving feedback to your peer, but you have to do it in a very civil way. And um, in a way, it's 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 about respect. It's about respect, and it's also about playing the ball and not the man. So so long as your intention is to get to a better outcome for the organization or the team, um, then you know, that makes everything different. If, you're, if, if your intention consciously or unconsciously is to make the next person look bad so I look better, right. then that's a disaster for everybody. So as leaders, if we notice any one of our people blaming 
or pointing fingers or trying to undermine the efforts of their colleagues, um, then that has to be squashed you know, as quickly as possible. If you think about it, um, I know that, that a lot of people struggle with equating you know, family analogies with uh, workplace analogies. But you know, if somebody is coming to you and saying, hey, mom, you know, my brother did X or Y, or it wasn't my fault, it was him. This is kind of a grown up version of all of that, right? Yeah, it is. Um, and, you know, unless, unless the, the sort of notional mum and dad, the leader of the team, um, sits those people down and says, hey, look, I'm not interested in hearing one of you complain about the other uh, or pointing fingers. We are here to achieve a thing together. That's what good looks like around here. Um, then, you know, they'll start to, they, real, they read what the leader approves of, whether it's spoken or unspoken. We have evolutionary superpowers. We know what pleases our boss. Mm. And that's mostly what we'll do. We do. Look, one more of the 10 dimensions that I do want to discuss is mistake tolerance. Yes. And the fact that um, to, to, to learn from mistakes rather than be, panic about avoiding mistakes. And that's, a, that's an important one, isn't it? It's a critical one. Um, no organisation can exist without mistakes. No human being can exist without mistakes. In fact, one of my favourite quotes, I don't even know who said it, um, but I've used it my whole life. Uh, the only people who don't make mistakes are the people who don't do anything. <laughs> um, and a very, oh, don't and do anything new. <laughs> oh, I don't do anything. <laughs> uh, yeah, don't do anything new could be. Uh, could be <laughs> As well. Be. As well, yeah. The extra, the extra mile. Um, yes, perfection. Uh, perfection is not a thing. Human beings don't can't do perfection. And so, all that's happening if a person is uh, hiding a mistake is that they are fearful of the social ramifications of that, and their subconscious is telling them, "Oh, this is dangerous. You won't belong in this tribe anymore." And you know, the subconscious is actually saying, "If you don't belong, you're going to die." Um, not just lose your job. Uh, so um, yes, mistake tolerance is extremely important. And for leaders, this is one of the hardest things to do because of course we don't want our team to make mistakes. We would like them to be perfect all the time, uh, but we have to accept that the, the fact that that's just not a thing. And so when a mistake happens, um, our choice in the moment is to you know, metaphorically kind of beat them up um, or, or humiliate them in front of the team, which is the worst possible thing you could ever do, um, or to say, okay, this didn't work. Uh, what are we going to do about it? And how are we going to learn from this for next time? You know, and the, the, the nuance around this is critical because if you say, oh, mistakes are learning opportunities, but your body language is going, what an idiot, um, people will read that. So it's really critical to um, think this through as a leader and to notice in the moment as it's happening. And, you know, we all leaders make mistakes too. You'll be astonished to hear, Nina. <laughs> and so if you find that when somebody makes a mistake and you respond in a way in the moment that you, you think about afterwards and you go, oh, no, I think I, you know, might have made that person feel like an idiot in front of the team then it's critically important at the next team meeting to say, you know what, when that thing happened and this was the way I responded, I really regret that response because actually it's incredibly important for us to learn from our mistakes. And I don't want anyone in this team to ever feel that they have to hide anything uh, because we can't be successful, we can't innovate if we aren't learning together. So I noticed my own response to that and I would like to just put it out there that it wasn't right and that was me making a mistake and you know so so demonstrating some vulnerability and courage and um, making sure people understand that mistakes are not sins they are they are always learning opportunities it takes a big person to do that but that's self-reflection and that's high emotional intelligence and that's what we want in our managers and leaders these days high eq leaders that that do that self-reflection and can apologize because yes. you know so i mean i know myself when i'm in front of the team i think i was a bit stressed and and I sort of was a bit short with someone 
I very quickly went up to them and said, look, I didn't mean to be so abrupt with you. And uh, I, I just been uh, under a bit of pressure today. So, and they, they appreciated that um, just my, my hum, humanity in that I said, look, you know, I'm not perfect and I wasn't perfect a minute ago and I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Vulnerability always looks like courage to other people. Uh, we, we think yeah. it's going to look like weakness. Oh, that's very we recognize it as courage in others. That's very interesting. Now, um, you do suggest creating some standing agenda items for meetings. Um, what were those again? Look, I'm a big fan of um, some form of brief, very brief check-in at the beginning of a team meeting. Uh, the one I like the most is having each person describe what percentage of themselves is in the room today and why. So it can happen in a couple of minutes. Um, you'd have, I don't know, 30 seconds each or something like that. Uh, and a person can say, look, I'm only 50% in the room today because my mother's having heart surgery this afternoon and I'm waiting for the doctor to call or whatever it might be. Um, or I'm 90% in the room today because I'm really excited about this thing we're doing later in the week and I'm raring to go. Um, so something like that, I think, just allows a very brief way for us to all be completely human, uh, to get to know one another and to build up that tolerance for vulnerability. Um, I think asking, you know, how's the capacity, how's everybody's capacity for the work we have to do this week, do we need to help one another? So setting up the, just normalising the idea that a team exists to be working together and helping each other. Um, you know, maybe someone from my team can help someone in your team this week because you guys are under the pump. You've got something super, um, you know, something very busy happening. Um, and then uh, once you have figured out what you want to encourage more of, so let's say, for example, you've been through the process um, that the book outlines, you've done a bit of a diagnostic and a discussion in your team, you've come to the conclusion that candor is the thing you as a team need to work on the most, then you would want to leave a little bit of space at the end of the meeting, perhaps, it doesn't have to be every meeting, but, but regularly, uh, to say, how are we doing? How are we going with candor? And just by asking the question, you are signaling that that is important, uh, that candor is important, and we agreed that we were going to work on it together. And so continuing to check in on how are we going. So whatever you choose to focus on to shift in the in the culture of the team, just continuing to check in. Well, we've so sort of pretty well coming to a close, Fiona, and it's just been the most fascinating and deep conversation. I've really enjoyed it. Now, where can people get the book? I assume it's on Amazon, is it? It is. Um, so you can get it uh, in the sort of uh, usual book places. It's on Apple Books. It's on Amazon. It's on uh, Booktopia. It's also available through my website. Uh, so that's just fionarobertson.com. Um, and there are things on the website that they can download. Uh, so the, the oh. culture diagnostic is available really? on the website. Oh, that's, um, that'd be a good one to download. Yes, I, really, just, I had a look at that in the book. That, that's really good. Yeah. And you can download chapter one for free from there as well, if you're interested in didn't, you know, nice. try before you buy. <laughs> <laughs> and do you, are you able to work virtually with people globally or, or how yes. do you work with people? Yeah. Yes, I have a mixture of things. So I do a lot of keynote speaking, um, you know, cultural literacy and helping people understand what culture actually is. Um, I do a culture planning process, which runs over a three month process online. Uh, I do leadership development programs and I also facilitate uh, full day offsites, design and deliver those for teams that are wanting to work more effectively together and think through their culture. Thank you so much, Fiona, for your time today, for, for the exploration of your ideas around culture. Um, it certainly opened up my eyes to some of the distinctions around culture and, and it, it dispelled a few myths that I was still keeping in my head, in my heart. And I'm going, well, it's always good when you're myth busting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you found it useful and thank you for a great conversation today. My pleasure, Fiona. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks once again. This episode, we've been speaking with Fiona Robertson, 
on the Manage Self Lead Others podcast for experienced and aspiring people managers. I'm your host, Nina Sunday. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye for now. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.